side where a team is waiting, and you all throw your backs into it, and you pull in turn. And eventually, the wheel roars to life, lights begin to flicker, and the audience cheers. And you've just activated Peter Hudson's Charon, one of the world's largest zoetropes. This is the farthest thing from marketable art. <laughs> it's huge. It's dangerous. It takes a dozen people to run, and it doesn't go with the sofa. It's beautifully crafted and completely useless, and it's wonderful. You're unlikely to see works like Caron in the art world headlines. These days, the buying and selling of artwork often gets more attention than the works themselves. In the last year, a Jean-Michel Basquiat sold for 110 million dollars, the highest price ever achieved for the work of an American artist. And a painting by Leonardo da Vinci sold for 450 million, setting a new auction record. Still, these are big, important artists. But still, when you look at these works and you look at the headlines, you have to ask yourself: Do I care about these because they move me? Or do I care about them because they're expensive and I think they're supposed to? In our contemporary world, it can be hard to separate those two things. But what if we tried? What if we redefined art's value not by its price tag, but by the emotional connection it creates between the artist and the audience, or the benefit it gives our society, or the fulfillment it gives the artists themselves? This is Nevada's Black Rock Desert, about as far as you can get from the galleries of New York and London and Hong Kong. And here, for just about 30 years at Burning Man, a movement has been forming that does exactly that. Since its early anarchist years, Burning Man has grown up. Today, it's more of an experiment in collective dreaming. It's a year-round community, and every August for a single week. Seventy thousand people power down their technology and pilgrimage out into the desert to build an anti-consumerist society outside the bounds of their everyday lives. The conditions are brutal. Strangers will hug you, and every year you will swear it was better than last. But it's still ridiculous and freeing and alive. And the art is one thing that thrives here. So. This is me on the desert playa last year with my brother, obviously hard at work. <laughs> I've been studying the art of Burning Man for several years for an exhibition I curated at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery. And what fascinates me the most isn't the quality of the work here, which is actually rather high. It's why people come out here into the desert again and again to get their hands dirty and make in our increasingly digital age. Because it seems like this gets to something that's essentially human. Really, the entire encampment of Burning Man could be thought of as one giant interactive art installation, driven by the participation of everyone in it. One thing that sets this work aside from the commercial art world is that anyone who makes work can show it. These days, around 300 art installations and countless artistic gestures go to the playa. None of them are sold there. At the end of the week, if the works aren't burned, artists have to cart them back out and store them. It's a tremendous labor of love. Though there's certainly a Burning Man aesthetic pioneered by artists like Kate Rowdenbush and Michael Christian, much of the distinctive character of the work here comes from the desert itself. For a work to succeed, it has to be portable enough to make the journey, rugged enough to withstand the wind and weather and participants. Stimulating in daylight and darkness, and engaging without interpretation. Encounters with monumental and intimate works here feel surreal. Scale has a tendency to fool the eyes. What looked enormous in an artist's studio could get lost on playa, but there are virtually no spatial limits, so artists can dream as big as they can build. Some pieces bowl you over by their grace. And others by the sheer audacity it took to bring them here. <laughs> Burning Man's irreverent humor comes out in pieces like Rebecca Waite's Church Trap, 
a tiny country chapel set precariously on a wooden beam like a mousetrap that lured participants in to find religion. It was built and burned in 2013. While other works, like Christopher Schart's Firmament, aim for the sublime, here, under a canopy of dancing lights set to classical music, participants could escape the thumping rave beats and chaos all around. At night, the city swarms with mutant vehicles, the only cars allowed to roam the playa. And if necessity is the mother of invention, here absurdity is its father. They zigzag from artwork to artwork like some bizarre, random public transportation system, pulsing with light and sound. When artists stop worrying about critics and collectors and start making work for themselves, these are the kinds of marvelous toys they create. And what's amazing is that, by and large, when people first come to Burning Man, they don't know how to make this stuff. It's the active, collaborative maker community there that makes this possible. Collectives like Five Ton Crane come together to share skills and take on complex projects a single artist would never even attempt, from a gothic rocket ship that appears ready to take off at any moment, to a fairy tale home inside a giant boot, complete with shelves full of artist-made books, a blackbird pie in the oven, and a climbable beanstalk. Skilled or unskilled, all are welcome. In fact, part of the charm and the innovation of the work here is that so many makers aren't artists at all, but scientists or engineers or welders or garbage collectors. And their works cross disciplinary boundaries, from a grove of origami mushrooms that developed out of the design for a yurt to a tree that responds to the voices and biorhythms of all those around it through 175,000 LEDs embedded in its leaves. In museums, a typical visitor spends less than 30 seconds with a work of art, and I often watch people wander from label to label, searching for information as though the entire story of a work of art could be contained in that one 80-word text. But in the desert, there are no gatekeepers and no placards explaining the art, just natural curiosity. You see a work on the horizon, and you ride towards it. When you arrive, you walk all around it. You touch it, you test it. Is it sturdy enough to climb on? Will I be impaled by it? <laughs> Art becomes a place for extended interaction, and although the display might be short-lived, the experience stays with you. Nowhere is that truer at Burning Man than at the temple. In 2000, David Best and Jack Hay built the first temple, and after a member of their team was killed tragically in an accident shortly before the event, the building became a makeshift memorial. By itself, it's a magnificent piece of architecture, but the structure is only a shell until it disappears under a thick blanket of messages. I miss you. Please forgive me. Even a broken crayon still colors. Intimate testaments to the most universal of human experiences, the experience of loss. The collective emotion in this place is overpowering and indescribable before it's set afire on the last night of the event. Every year, something compels people from all different walks of life, from all over the world, to go out into the desert and make art when there is no money in it. The work's not always refined, it's not always viable, it's not even always good, but it's authentic and optimistic in a way we rarely see anywhere else. In these cynical times, it's comforting to know that we're still capable of great feats of imagination, and that when we search for connection, we come together and build cathedrals in the dust. Forget the price tags, forget the big names. What is art for in our contemporary world, if not this? Thank you.
We live in a world increasingly tyrannized by the screen, by our phones, by our tablets, by our televisions and our computers. We can have any experience that we want, but feel nothing. We can have as many friends as we want, but have nobody to shake hands with. I want to take you to a different kind of world, a world of the imagination, where using this most powerful tool that we have, we can transform both our physical surroundings, but in doing so, we can change forever how we feel and how we feel about the people that we share the planet with. My company, Artichoke, which I co-founded in 2006, was set up to create moments. We all have moments in our lives, and when we're on our deathbeds, we're not going to remember the daily commute to work on the number 38 bus or our struggle to find a parking space every day when we go to the shop. We're going to remember those moments when our kid took their first step or when we got picked for the football team or when we fell in love. So Artichoke exists to create moving, ephemeral moments that transform the physical world using the imagination of the artist to show us what is possible. We create beauty amongst ruins. We re-examine our history. We create moments to which everyone is invited, either to witness or to take part. It all started for me way back in the 1990s when I was appointed as festival director in the tiny British city of Salisbury. You'll probably have heard of it. Here's the uh, Salisbury Cathedral, and here's the nearby Stonehenge Monument, which is world famous. Salisbury is a city that's been dominated for hundreds of years by the church, the Conservative Party, and the army. It's a place where people really love to observe the rules. So picture me on my first year in the city, cycling the wrong way down a one-way street late. I'm always late. It's a wonder I've even turned up today. <laughs> a little old lady on the sidewalk helpfully shouted at me, my dear, you're going the wrong way. Charmingly, I thought. I said, yeah, I know. I hope you die, she screamed. <laughs> and I realized that this was a place where I was in trouble. And yet, a year later, persuasion, negotiation, everything I could deploy saw me producing the work, not a classical concert in a church or a poetry reading, but the work of a French street theatre company who were telling the story of Faust, Mephistomania, on stilts, complete with handheld pyrotechnics. The day after, same little old lady stopped me in the street and said, were you responsible for last night? I backed away. <laughs> yes. When I heard about it, she said, I knew it wasn't for me. But Helen, my dear, it was. So what has happened? Curiosity had triumphed over suspicion, and delight had banished anxiety. So I wondered how one could transform, transfer these ideas to a larger stage, and started on a journey to do the same kind of thing to London. Imagine, it's a world city. Like all our cities, it's dedicated to toil, trade and traffic. It's a machine to get you to work on time and back. And we're all complicit in wanting the routines to be uh, fixed and for everybody to be able to know what's going to happen next. And yet, what if this amazing city could be turned into a stage, a platform, for something so unimaginable that would somehow transform people's lives? We do these things often in Britain. I'm sure you do them wherever you're from. Here's Horse Guards Parade, and here's something that we do often. It's always about winning things. It's about the marathon or winning a war or triumphant cricket team coming home. We close the streets, everybody claps. But for theatre, not possible. Except a story told by a French company, a saga about a little girl and a giant elephant that came to visit for four days, and all I had to do was persuade the public authorities that shutting the city for four days was something completely normal. <laughs> no traffic, just people enjoying themselves, coming out to marvel and witness this extraordinary artistic endeavor by the French theatre company Royale Deluxe. It was a seven-year journey, with me saying to a group of men, almost always men, sitting in a room, it's like a fairy story with a little girl and this giant elephant, and they come to town for four days, and everybody gets to come and watch and play. And they would go, why would we do this? Is it 
for something? Is it celebrating a presidential visit? Is it the Entente Cordiale between France and England? Is it for charity? Are you trying to raise money? And I'd say, "Mm, none of these things. And they'd say, why would we do this? But after four years, this magic trick, this extraordinary thing happened. I was sitting in the same meeting I'd been to for four years saying, please, please may I? Instead of which, I didn't say please. I said, this thing that we've been talking about for such a long time, it's happening on these dates. And I really need you to help me. This magic thing happened. Everybody in the room somehow decided that somebody else had said yes. (laughs) They decided that they were not being asked to take responsibility. Or maybe the bus planning manager was being asked to take responsibility for planning the bus diversions. And the council officer was being asked to close the roads. And the Transport for London people were being asked to sort out the underground. All these people were only being asked to do the thing that they could do that would help us. Nobody was being asked to take responsibility. And I in my innocence, thought, well, I'll take responsibility for what turned out to be a million people on the street. It was our first show. It was our first show, and it changed the nature of the appreciation of culture, not in a gallery, not in a theatre, not in an opera house, but live and on the streets, transforming public space for the broadest possible audience, people who would never buy a ticket to see anything. So there we were, we'd finished, and we've continued to produce work of this kind. As you can see, the company's work is astonishing, but what's also astonishing is the fact that permission was granted. And you don't see any security. And this was nine months after terrible terrorist bombings that had ripped London apart. So I began to wonder whether it was possible to do this kind of stuff in even more complicated circumstances. We turned our attention to Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland, depending on your point of view. This is a map of, the, uh, of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, the island to the left. For generations, it's been a place of conflict. The largely Catholic Republic in the south and the largely Protestant loyalist community. Hundreds of years of conflict... British troops on the streets for over 30 years. And now, although there is a peace process, this is today in this city called Londonderry, if you're a loyalist, called Derry, if you're a Catholic. But everybody calls it home. And I began to wonder whether there was a way in which the community tribalism could be addressed through art and the imagination. This is what the communities do every summer, each community. This is a bonfire filled with effigies and insignia from the people that they hate on the other side. This is the same from the loyalist community. And every summer they burn them. They're right in the center of town. So we turned to here, to the Nevada desert, to Burning Man, where people also do bonfires, but with a completely different set of values. Here you see the work of David Best and his extraordinary temples, which are built during the Burning Man event and then incinerated on the Sunday. So we invited him and his community to come, and we recruited from both sides of the political and religious divide, young people, unemployed people, people who would never normally come across each other or speak to each other. And out of their extraordinary work rose a temple to rival the two cathedrals that exist in the town, one Catholic and one Protestant. But this was a temple to no religion, for everyone, for no community, but for everyone. And we put it in this place where everyone told me nobody would come. It was too dangerous. It was sat between two communities. I just kept saying, but it's got such a great view. And again, that same old question, why wouldn't we do this? What you see in the picture is the beginning of 426 primary school children who were walked up the hill by the head teacher who didn't want them to lose this opportunity. And just as happens in the Nevada desert, though in slightly different uh, temperatures, uh, the people of this community, 65,000 of them, turned out to write their grief, their pain, their hope, their hopes for the future, their love, because in the end, this is only about love. 
They live in a post-conflict society, lots of post-traumatic stress, high suicide, and yet, for this brief moment, and it would be ridiculous to assume that it was more than that, somebody like Kevin, a Catholic whose father was shot when he was nine, upstairs in bed, Kevin came to work as a volunteer, and he was the first person to embrace the elderly Protestant lady who came through the door on the day we opened the, the temple to the public. It rose up, it sat there for five days, and then we chose from our little tiny band of non-sectarian builders who'd given us their lives for this period of months to make this extraordinary thing. And we chose from them the people who would incinerate it. And here you see the moment when witnessed by 15,000 people who turned out on a dark, cold March evening, the moment when they decided to put their enmity behind them to inhabit this shared space where everybody had an opportunity to say the things that had been unsayable to say out loud, you hurt me and my family, but I forgive you. And together, they watched as members of their community let go this thing that was so beautiful, but was as hard to let go of as those thoughts and feelings that had gone into making it. Thank you. This theater is built on Copacabana, which is the most famous beach in the world. But 25 kilometers away from here, in the north zone of Rio, lies a community called Villa Cruzeiro, and roughly 60,000 people live there. Now, the people here in Rio mostly know Villa Cruzeiro from the news, and unfortunately, news from Villa Cruzeiro often is not good news. But Villa Cruzeiro is also the place where our story begins. Ten years ago, we first came to Rio to shoot a documentary about life in the favelas. Now, we learned that favelas are informal communities. They emerged over the years when immigrants from the countryside came to the cities looking for work, like cities within the cities, known for problems with crime, poverty, and the violent drug war between police and the drug gangs. So what struck us was that these were communities that the people who lived there had built with their own hands without a master plan, and like a giant work in progress. Where we're from, in Holland, everything is planned. We even have rules for how to follow the rules. <laughs> so the last day of filming, we ended up in Villa Cruzeiro, and we were sitting down and we had a drink, and we were overlooking this hill with all these houses. And most of these houses looked unfinished, and they had walls of bare brick, but we saw some of these houses that were plastered and painted. And suddenly we had this idea, what would it look like if all these houses would be plastered and painted? And then we imagined one big design, you know, like one big work of art. Like, who would expect something like that in a place like this? So we thought, would that even be possible? So first we started to count the houses, but we soon lost count. But um, somehow the idea stuck. We had a friend. He ran an NGO in Villa Cruzeiro. His name was Nanko, and he also liked the idea. He said, you know, everybody here would pretty much love to have their houses plastered and painted. It's when a house is finished. So he introduced us to the right people, and Vitor and Mauri became our crew. We picked three houses in the center of the community, and we start here. We made a few designs, 
And everybody liked this design of a boy flying a kite the best. So we started painting, and the first thing we did was to paint everything blue. And we thought that looked already pretty good. But they hated it. The people who lived there really hated it. They said, what did you do? You painted our house in exactly the same color as the police station. <laughs> in a favela, that is not a good thing. Also the same color as the prison cell. So we quickly went ahead and we painted the boy. And then we thought we were finished. We were really happy. But still, it wasn't good because the little kids started coming up to us and they said, you know, there's a boy flying a kite, but where is this kite? We said, it's, it's art. You know, you have to imagine the kite. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 we want to see the kite. So we quickly installed the kite way up high on the hill so that you could see the boy flying the kite and you could actually see a kite. So the local news started writing about it, which was great. And then even Guardian wrote about it. Notorious slum becomes open air gallery. So, encouraged by this success, we went back to Rio for a second project, and we stumbled upon this street. It was covered in concrete to prevent mudslides, and somehow we saw a sort of river in it. And we imagined this river to be a river in Japanese style, with koi carp swimming upstream. So we decided to paint that river. And uh, we invited uh, Rob Admiral, who is a tattoo artist, and he specialized in the Japanese style. So little did we know that we would spend almost an entire year uh, painting that river together with uh, um, Giovanni and Robinho and Vitor, who lived nearby. And uh, we even moved into the neighborhood when uh, one of the guys that lived on the street, Elias, told us that we could come and live in his house together with his family, which was fantastic. Unfortunately, during that time, another war broke out between the police and the drug gang. <laughs> we learned that during those times, um, people in communities really stick together during these times of hardship. But we also learned a very important element the importance of barbecues. <laughs> Because when you throw a barbecue, it kind of turns you from a guest into a host. So we decided to throw one almost every other week, and we got to know everybody in the neighborhood. We still had this idea of the hill, though. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about the scale of this, because this painting was incredibly big, and it was insanely detailed, and this uh, process almost drove us completely insane ourselves. But um, we figured that maybe during this process, all the time that we had spent in the neighborhood was maybe actually even more important than the painting itself. So after all that time, this hill, this idea was still there. And we started to make sketches, models, and we figured something out. We figured that our ideas, our designs had to be a little bit more simple than that last project so that we could, you know, paint with more people and cover more houses at the same time. And we had an opportunity to try that out in a community in the center part of Rio, which is called Santa Marta. And um, we made a design for this place, which looked like this. And then we got people to go along with it, because it turns out that if your idea is ridiculously big, it's easier to get people to go along with this. <laughs> and the people of Santa Marta uh, got together, and in a little over a month, they turned that square into this. And this image somehow went all over the world. So then we received an uh, unexpected phone call from the Philadelphia Mural Arts Program. And um, they had this question, if this idea, our approach, if this would actually work in North Philly, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the United States. So uh, we immediately said yes. Um, now, we had no idea how, but it seemed like a very interesting challenge. So we did exactly the same as we did in Rio, and we moved into the neighborhood and started barbecuing. <laughs> so the project took almost two years to complete, and we made individual designs for every single house on the avenue that we painted. And we made these designs together with the local store owners, the building owners, and um, a team of uh, 
um, about a dozen young men and women. They were hired, and then they were trained as painters. And together, they transformed their own neighborhood, the whole street, into a giant patchwork of color. And, and at the end, the city of Philadelphia thanked every single one of them and gave them like a merit for their accomplishment. So now we had painted a whole street. How about we do this whole hill now? We started looking for funding, but instead, we just ran into questions. Like, how many houses are you going to paint? How many square meters is that? How much paint are you going to use? And how many people are you going to employ? And we, we did try for years to write plans, you know, for the funding and answer all those questions. But then we thought, you know, in order to answer all those questions, you have to know exactly what you're going to do before you actually get there and, and, you, and start. And maybe it's a, it's a mistake to think like that. It would lose some of the magic that we had learned about that if you go somewhere and you spend time there, you can let the project grow organically and have a life of its own. So what we did is um, we decided to, to take this plan and strip it away from all the numbers, you know, and all the ideas and presumptions and just go back to the base idea, which was to transform this hill into a giant work of art. And instead of looking for funding, we started a crowdfunding campaign. And in a little over a month, more than 1,500 people got together and donated over $100,000. So for, the, for us, this was an amazing moment, because now, because now we, we finally had the freedom to use all the lessons that we had learned and create a project that was built the same way that the favela was built, from the ground on up, bottom up, with no master plan. So... We went back and we employed Angelo, and he's a local artist from Villa Cruzeiro, very talented guy, and he knows almost everybody there. And then we employed Elias, our former landlord, who invited us into his house, and he's a master of construction. Together with them, we decided where to start. We picked this spot in Villa Cruzeiro, and houses are being plastered as we speak. And they, the good thing about them is that they are deciding which houses goes next. They're even printing T-shirts, they're putting up banners, explaining everything to everybody and talking to the press. This article about Angelo that appeared. So while this is happening, we're bringing this idea all over the world. So uh, like the project we did in Philadelphia, we are, were also invited to do workshops, for instance, in Curaçao. Uh, and right now we're planning a huge project in Haiti. So the favela was not only the place where this idea started, it was also the place that made it possible to work without a master plan, because these com communities are informal, this was the inspiration. And in a communal effort, together with the people, you can almost work like in an orchestra, where you have 100 instruments playing together to create a symphony. So we want to thank everybody who wanted to become part of this dream and supported us along the way. And we are looking at continuing. Yeah, and so one day, pretty soon, when the colors start going up on these walls, we hope more people will join us and, and you know, join this big dream. And so maybe one day, the whole of Villa Cruzeiro will be painted. Thank you. <laughs>
One sculpture became two. Two quickly became 26. And before I knew it, we had the world's first underwater sculpture park. In 2009, I moved to Mexico and started by casting local fishermen. This grew to a small community, to almost an entire movement of people in defense of the sea, and then finally to an underwater museum with over 500 living sculptures. Gardening, it seems, is not just for greenhouses. We've since scaled up the designs. Ocean Atlas in the Bahamas, rising 16 feet up to the surface and weighing over 40 tons. To now, currently in Lanzarote, where I'm making an underwater botanical garden, the first of its kind in the Atlantic Ocean. Each project, we use materials and designs that help encourage life. A long-lasting pH-neutral cement provides a stable and permanent platform. It is textured to allow coral polyps to attach. We position them down current from natural reefs so that after spawning, there's areas for them to settle. The formations are all configured so that they aggregate fish on a really large scale. Even this VW beetle has an internal living habitat to encourage crustaceans such as lobsters and sea urchins. So why exhibit my work in the ocean? Because honestly, it's really not easy. When you're in the middle of the sea, under a 100-foot crane, trying to lower eight tons down to the sea floor, you start to wonder whether I shouldn't have taken up watercolor painting instead. <laughs> but in the end, the results always blow my mind. The ocean is the most incredible exhibition space an artist could ever wish for. You have amazing lighting effects, changing by the hour, explosions of sand covering the sculptures in a cloud of mystery, a unique timeless quality, and a procession of inquisitive visitors, each lending their own special touch to the site. But over the years, I've realized that the greatest thing about what we do, the really humbling thing about the work, is that as soon as we submerge the sculptures, they're not ours anymore. Because as soon as we sink them, the sculptures, they belong to the sea. As new reefs form, a new world literally starts to evolve, a world that continuously amazes me. It's a bit of a cliche, but nothing man-made can ever match the imagination of nature. Sponges look like veins across the faces. Staghorn coral morphs the form. Fireworms scrawl white lines as they feed. Tunicates explode from the faces. Sea urchins crawl across the bodies feeding at night. Coralline algae applies a kind of purple paint. The deepest red I've ever seen in my life lives underwater. Gorgonian fans oscillate with the waves. Purple sponges breathe water like air. And grey angelfish glide silently overhead. And the amazing response we've had to these works tells me that we've managed to plug into something really primal, because it seems that these images translate across the world, and that's made me focus on my responsibility as an artist and about what I'm trying to achieve. I'm standing here today on this boat in the middle of the ocean, and this couldn't be a better place to talk about the really, really important effect of my work. Because as we all know, our reefs are dying and our oceans are in trouble. So here's the thing. 
the most used, searched, and shared image of all my work thus far is this. And I think this is for a reason, or at least I hope it is. What I really hope is that people are beginning to understand that when we think of the environment and the destruction of nature, that we need to start thinking about our oceans too. Since building these sites, we've seen some phenomenal and unexpected results. Besides creating over 800 square meters of new habitats and living reef, visitors to the marine park in Cancun now divide half their time between the museum and the natural reefs, providing significant rest for natural overstressed areas. Visitors to Ocean Atlas in the Bahamas highlight a, a leak from a nearby oil refinery. The subsequent international media forced the local government to pledge $10 million in coastal cleanups. The sculpture park in Grenada was instrumental in the government designating the spot a marine protected area. Entrance fees to the park now help fund park rangers to manage tourism and fishing quotas. The site was actually listed as a wonder of the world by National Geographic. So why are we all here today in this room? What do we all have in common? I think we all share a fear that we don't protect our oceans enough. And one way of thinking about this is that we don't regard our oceans as sacred, and we should. When we see incredible places like the Himalayas or the Sagrada Familia or the Mona Lisa even, when we see these incredible places and things, we understand their importance. We call them sacred and we do our best to cherish them, to protect them and to keep them safe. But in order to do that, we are the ones that have to assign that value. Otherwise, they'll be desecrated by someone who doesn't understand that value. So I want to finish up tonight by talking about sacred things. When we were naming the site in Cancun, we named it a museum for a very important and simple reason. Museums are places of preservation, of conservation, and of education. They're places where we keep objects of great value to us, where we simply treasure them for them being themselves. If someone was to throw an egg at the Sistine Chapel, we'd all go crazy. If someone wanted to build a seven-star hotel at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, then we would laugh them out of Arizona. Yet every day, we dredge, pollute, and overfish our oceans. And I think it's easier for us to do that because when we see the ocean, we don't see the havoc we're wrecking. Because most people, the ocean is like this. And it's really hard to think of something that's just so plain and so enormous as fragile. It's simply too massive, too vast, too endless. And what do you see here? I think most people actually look past to the horizon. So I think there's a real danger that we never really see the sea. And if we don't really see it, if it doesn't have its own iconography, if we miss its majesty, then there's a big danger that we take it for granted. Cancun is famous for spring break, tequila and foam parties, and its waters are where frat boys can ride around on jet skis and banana boats. But because of our work there, there's now a little corner of Cancun that is simply precious for being itself. And we don't want to stop in Grenada, uh, in Cancun or the Bahamas. Just last month, I installed these four horsemen of the apocalypse in the Thames River, in central London, right in front of the Houses of Parliament, putting a stark message about climate change in front of the people that have the power to help change things. Because for me, this is just the beginning of the mission. We want to team up with other inventors, creators, philanthropists, educators, biologists, to see better futures for our oceans. And we want to see beyond sculpture, beyond art even, Say you're a 14-year-old kid from the city and you've never seen the ocean, and instead of getting taken to the National History Museum or an aquarium, you get taken out to the ocean to an underwater Noah's Ark, which you can access through a dry glass viewing tunnel where you could see all the wildlife of the land be colonized by the wildlife of the ocean. Clearly, it would blow your mind. So let's think big and let's think deep. Who knows where our imaginations and willpower can lead us? I hope that by bringing our art into the ocean, that not only do we take advantage of amazing creativity and visual impact of the setting, 
so that we're also giving something back. And by encouraging new environments to thrive, and in some way opening up a new, or maybe it's a really old way of seeing the seas as delicate, precious places worthy of our protection. Our oceans are sacred. Thank you. Twelve years ago, I was in the street writing my name to say I exist. Then I went to taking photos of people to paste them on street to say they exist. From the suburbs of Paris to the wall of Israel and Palestine, the rooftop of Kenya to the favelas of Rio. Paper and glue, as easy as that. I asked a question last year, can art change the world? Well, let me tell you, in terms of changing the world, there have been a lot of competition this year, because <laughs> the art spring is still spreading. The Eurozone has collapsed. Uh, what else? The Occupy movement, you know, find a voice. And I still have to speak English constantly, so there have been a lot of change. <laughs> so when I had my TED wish last year, I said, look, I'm going to switch my concept. You are going to take the photos, you're going to send them to me, I'm going to print them and send them back to you. Then you're going to paste them where it makes sense for you to place your own statement. This is inside out. 100,000 posters have been printed this year. Those are the kind of posters, let me show you. And send, and we keep sending more every day. This is the size. Just a regular piece of paper with a little big bit of ink on it. This one was from Haiti. When I announced my wish last year, hundreds of people stood up and said they wanted to help us. But I say it has to be under the condition I have always worked. No credit, no logos, no sponsoring. A week later, a handful of people were there, ready to rock and empower the people on the ground who wanted to change the world. These are the people I want to talk to you about today. Two weeks after my speech in Tunisia, hundreds of portraits were made, and they pasted every single portrait of the dictator by their own photos. Boom! This is what happened. Slim and his friends went to the countries and pasted hundreds of photos everywhere to show the diversity in the country. They really make inside out their own project. Actually, that photo was pasted in the police station, and what you see on the ground are ID cards of all the photos of people being tracked by the police. Russia. Chad wanted to fight against homophobia in Russia. He went with his friend in front of every Russian embassy in Europe and stand there with their photo to say, we have rights. They used Inside Out as a platform for protest. Karachi, Pakistan. Charmin is actually here. She organized a TEDx action out there and made the, all the unseen faces of the city on the walls in her town. And I want to thank her today. North Dakota. Standing Rock Nation in this turtle island. DJ Two Beers from the Dakota Lakota tribe wanted to show that the Native American are still here. The seven generation are still fighting for their rights. He pasted up portraits all over his reservation, and he's here also today. Each time I'm getting a wall in New York, I'm using his photos to continue spreading the project. Juarez. You heard the border, one of the most dangerous border in the world. Monica 
have taken thousands of portraits with a group of photographs and covered the entire border. Do you know what it takes to do this? People, energy, make the glue, organize the team. It was amazing. While in Iran, at the same time, Abu Lolo, of course a nickname, has pasted one single face of a woman to show his resistance against the government. I don't have to explain to you what kind of risk he took for that action. There is tons of school projects. 20% of the poster we're receiving comes from school. Education is so essential. Kids just make photos in a class, the teacher receives them, they place them on the school, here they even got the help of the firemen. There should be even more schools doing this kind of project. Of course, we wanted to go back to Israel and Palestine. So we went there with truck. This is photo booth truck. You go on the back of that truck, take your photo, 30 seconds later, take it from the side, you're ready to rock. <laughs> Thousands of people use them, and each of them sign up for a two-state peace solution. And then walk in the street. This is the march, the 450,000 march, being of, of September, they were all holding their photo as a statement. On the other side, people were wrapping up streets, buildings, it's everywhere. Come on, don't tell me that people are not ready for peace out there. These projects took thousands of actions in one year, making hundreds of thousands of people participating, creating millions of views. This is the biggest global art participatory projects that's going on. So back to the questions, can I change the world? Maybe not in one year. That's the beginning. But maybe we should change the question. Can art change people's lives? From what I've seen this year, yes. And you know what? It's just the beginning. Let's turn the world inside out together. Thank you. Thank you. I consider it my life's mission to convey the urgency of climate change through my work. I've traveled north to the Arctic to capture the unfolding story of polar melt, and south to the equator to document the subsequent rising seas. Most recently, I visited the icy coast of Greenland and the low-lying islands of the Maldives, connecting two seemingly disparate but equally endangered parts of our planet. My drawings explore moments of transition, turbulence, and tranquility in the landscape, allowing viewers to emotionally connect with a place you might never have the chance to visit. I choose to convey the beauty as opposed to the devastation. If you can experience the sublimity of these landscapes, perhaps you'll be inspired to protect and preserve them. Behavioral psychology tells us that we take action and make decisions based on our emotions above all else. And studies have shown that art impacts our emotions more effectively than a scary news report. Experts predict ice-free Arctic summers as early as 2020, and sea levels are likely to rise between two and 10 feet by century's end. I have dedicated my career to illuminating these projections with an accessible medium, one that moves us in a way that statistics may not. My process begins with traveling to the places at the forefront of climate change. On site, I take thousands of photographs, and back in the studio, I work from both my memory of the experience and the photographs to create very large-scale compositions, sometimes over 10 feet wide. 
I draw with soft pastel, which is dry, like charcoal, but colors. I consider my work drawings, but others call them painting. I cringe, though, when I'm referred to as a finger painter. <laughs> but I don't use any tools, and I have always used my fingers and palms to manipulate the pigment on the paper. Drawing is a form of meditation for me. It quiets my mind. I don't perceive what I'm drawing as ice or water. Instead, the image is stripped down to its most basic form of color and shape. Once the piece is complete, I can finally experience the composition as a whole, as an iceberg floating through glassy water or a wave cresting with foam. On average, a piece this size takes me about, as you can see, 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really more like 200 hours, 250 hours for something that size. But I've been drawing ever since I could hold a crayon, really. My mom was an artist, and growing up, we always had art supplies all over the house. My mother's love of photography propelled her to the most remote regions of the earth, and my family and I were fortunate enough to join and support her on these adventures. We rode camels, in northern Africa and mushing on dog sleds near the North Pole. In August of 2012, I led my first expedition, taking a group of artists and scholars up the northwest coast of Greenland. My mother was originally supposed to lead this trip. She and I were in the early stages of planning as we had intended to go together when she fell victim to a brain tumor. The cancer quickly took over her body and mind, and she passed away six months later. During the months of her illness, though, her dedication to the expedition never wavered, and I made a promise to carry out her final journey. My mother's passion for the Arctic echoed through my experience in Greenland, and I felt the power and the fragility of the landscape. The sheer size of the icebergs is humbling. The ice fields are alive with movement and sound in a way that I never expected. I expanded the scale of my compositions to give you that same sense of awe that I experienced. Yet while the grandeur of the ice is evident, so too is its vulnerability. From our boat, I could see the ice sweating under the unseasonably warm sun. We had a chance to visit many of the Inuit communities in Greenland that now face huge challenges. The locals spoke to me of vast areas of sea ice that are no longer freezing over as they once did, and without ice, their hunting and harvesting grounds are severely diminished, threatening their way of life and survival. The melting glaciers in Greenland are one of the largest contributing factors to rising sea levels, which have already begun to drown some of our world's lowest-lying islands. One year after my trip to Greenland, I visited the Maldives, the lowest and flattest country in the entire world. While I was there, I collected images and inspiration for a new body of work, drawings, of waves lapping on the coast of a nation that could be entirely underwater within this century. Devastating events happen every day, on scales both global and personal. When I was in Greenland, I scattered my mother's ashes amidst the melting ice. Now she remains a part of the landscape she loved so much, even as it, too, passes and takes on new form. Among the many gifts my mother gave me was the ability to focus on the positive rather than the negative. My drawings celebrate the beauty of what we all stand to lose. I hope they can serve as records of sublime landscapes in flux, documenting the transition and inspiring our global community to take action for the future. Thank you.
story is about taking imagination seriously. 14 years ago, I first encountered this ordinary material, fishnet, used the same way for centuries. Today, I'm using it to create permanent, billowing, voluptuous forms, the scale of hard-edged buildings in cities around the world. I was an unlikely person to be doing this. I never studied sculpture, engineering, or architecture. In fact, after college, I applied to seven art schools and was rejected by all seven. I went off on my own to become an artist, and I painted for 10 years when I was offered a Fulbright to India. Promising to give exhibitions of paintings, I shipped my paints and arrived in Mahabalipuram. The deadline for the show arrived. My paints didn't. I had to do something. This fishing village was famous for sculpture, so I tried bronze casting. But to make large forms was too heavy and expensive. I went for a walk on the beach, watching the fishermen bundle their nets into mounds on the sand. I'd seen it every day, but this time I saw it differently. A new approach to sculpture, a way to make volumetric form without heavy, solid materials. My first satisfying sculpture was made in collaboration with these fishermen. It's a self-portrait titled, Wide Hips. <laughs> We hoisted them on poles to photograph. I discovered their soft surfaces revealed every ripple of wind in constantly changing patterns. I was mesmerized. I continued studying craft traditions and collaborating with artisans, next in Lithuania with lace makers. I liked the fine detail it gave my work, but I wanted to make them larger, to shift from being an object you look at to something you could get lost in. Returning to India to work with those fishermen, we made a net of a million and a half hand-tied knots. Installed briefly in Madrid, thousands of people saw it, and one of them was the urbanist Manuel Solo Morales, who was redesigning the waterfront in Porto, Portugal. He asked if I could build this as a permanent piece for the city. I didn't know if I could do that and preserve my art. Durable, engineered, permanent, those are in opposition to idiosyncratic, delicate, and ephemeral. <laughs> for two years, I searched for a fiber that could survive ultraviolet rays, salt air, pollution, and at the same time remain soft enough to move fluidly in the wind. We needed something to hold the net up out there in the middle of the traffic circle. So we raised this 45,000 pound steel ring. We had to engineer it to move gracefully in an average breeze and survive in hurricane winds. But there was no engineering software to model something porous and moving. I found a brilliant aeronautical engineer who designed sails for America's Cup racing yachts, named Peter Heppel. He helped me tackle the twin challenges of precise shape and gentle movement. I couldn't build this the way I knew, because hand-tied knots weren't going to withstand a hurricane. So I developed a relationship with an industrial fishnet factory, learned the variables of their machines, and figured out a way to make lace with them. There was no language to translate this ancient, idiosyncratic handcraft into something machine operators could produce. So we had to create one. Three years and two children later, <laughs> we raised this 50,000 square foot lace net. It was hard to believe that what I had imagined was now built, permanent, and had lost nothing in translation. <laughs> This intersection had been bland and anonymous. Now it had a sense of place. I walked underneath it for the first time. As I watched the wind's choreography unfold, I felt sheltered and at the same time connected to limitless sky. My life was not going to be the same.
I want to create these oases of sculpture in spaces of cities around the world. I'm going to share two directions that are new in my work. Historic Philadelphia City Hall, its plaza I felt needed a material for sculpture that was lighter than netting. So we experimented with tiny atomized water particles to create a dry mist that is shaped by the wind. And in testing, discovered it can be shaped by people who can interact and move through it without getting wet. I'm using this sculpture material to trace the paths of subway trains above ground in real time, like an x-ray of the city's circulatory system unfolding. Next challenge, the Biennial of the Americas in Denver asked, could I represent the 35 nations of the Western Hemisphere and their interconnectedness in a sculpture? <laughs> I didn't know where to begin, but I said yes. I read about the recent earthquake in Chile and the tsunami that rippled across the entire Pacific Ocean. It shifted the Earth's tectonic plates sped up the planet's rotation, and literally shortened the length of the day. So I contacted NOAA, and I asked if they'd share their data on the tsunami, and translated it into this. Its title, 1.26, refers to the number of microseconds that the Earth's day was shortened. I couldn't build this with a steel ring the way I knew. Its shape was too complex now. So I replaced the metal armature with a soft, fine mesh of a fiber 15 times stronger than steel. The sculpture could now be entirely soft, which made it so light it could tie into existing buildings, literally becoming part of the fabric of the city. There was no software that could extrude these complex net forms and model them with gravity, so we had to create it. Then I got a call from New York City asking if I could adapt these concepts to Times Square or the High Line. This new soft structural method enables me to model these and build these sculptures at the scale of skyscrapers. They don't have funding yet, but I dream now of bringing these to cities around the world where they're most needed. Fourteen years ago, I searched for beauty in the traditional things, in craft forms. Now I combine them with high-tech materials and engineering to create voluptuous billowing forms, the scale of buildings. My artistic horizons continue to grow. I'll leave you with this story. I got a call from a friend in Phoenix, an attorney in the office who'd never been interested in art, never visited the local art museum, dragged everyone she could from the building and got them outside to lie down underneath the sculpture. There they were in their business suits, lying in the grass, noticing the changing patterns of wind beside people they didn't know, sharing the rediscovery of wonder. Thank you. 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 I'm a potter, which seems like a fairly humble vocation. Uh, I, I know a lot about pots. I spent about 15 years making them. One of the things that really excites me in my artistic practice and, and being trained as a potter 
is that you uh, very quickly learn how to make great things out of nothing. That I spent a lot of time at my wheel with mounds of clay trying stuff. And that the limitations of my capacity, my ability, was based on my hands and my imagination. That if I wanted to make a really nice bowl and I didn't know how to make a foot yet, I would have to um, learn how to make a foot. That that process of learning has been very, very helpful to my life. I feel like as a potter, you also start to learn how to shape the world. There have been times in my artistic capacity that I've wanted to reflect on other really important moments in the history of, of the U.S., the history of the world, where tough things happened. But how do you talk about tough ideas without separating people from that content? Could I use art? like these old, discontinued fire hoses from Alabama to talk about the complexities of a moment of civil rights in the 60s? Is it possible to talk about my father and I doing labor projects? My dad was a roofer, construction guy. He owned small businesses. And at 80, he was ready to retire, and his tar kettle was my inheritance. Now, a tar kettle doesn't sound like much of an inheritance. It wasn't. It was stinky, and it took up a lot of space in my studio. But I asked my dad if he would be willing to make some art with me, if we could reimagine this kind of nothing material as something very special. And by elevating the material in my dad's uh, skill, could we start to think about tar just like clay in a new way, shaping it differently, helping us to imagine what was possible. After clay, I was then kind of turned on to lots of different kinds of materials, and my studio grew a lot because I thought, well, it's not really about the material, it's about our capacity to shape things. I became more and more interested in ideas and more and more things that were happening just outside uh, my studio. Just to give you a little bit of context, I live in Chicago. Uh, I live on the south side now. I'm a west sider. For those of you who are not Chicagoans, that won't mean anything. But if I didn't mention that I was a West Sider, there would be a lot of people in the city that were very upset. <laughs> the neighborhood that I live in is Grand Crossing. It's a neighborhood that has seen better days. Uh, it is not a gated community by far. There's lots of abandonment uh, in my neighborhood. And while I was kind of busy making pots and busy making art and having a good art career, there was all of this stuff that was happening uh, just outside my studio. All of us know about failing housing markets and the challenges of blight. And I feel like we talk about it with some of our cities more than others, but I think a lot of our U.S. cities and beyond have the challenge of blight, abandoned buildings that people no longer know what to do anything with. And so I thought, is there a way that I could start to think about these buildings as an extension or an expansion of my artistic practice? And that if I was thinking along with other creatives, architects, engineers, real estate finance people, that us together might be able to kind of think in more complicated ways about the reshaping of cities. And so I bought a building. The building was really affordable. We tricked it out. We made it as beautiful as we could to try to just get some activity happening on my block. Once I bought the building for about $18,000, I didn't have any money left. Uh, and so I started sweeping the building as a kind of performance. I was like, no, uh, this is performance art. And people would come over and I'd start sweeping because the broom was free and sweeping was free. It worked out. <laughs> But we would, we would use the building then to stage exhibitions, small dinners, And we found that that building uh, on my block, Dorchester, we now refer to the block as Dorchester Projects, that in a way, um, that building became a kind of gathering site for lots of different kinds of activity. We turned the building into what we call now the Archive House. The Archive House would do all of these amazing things. Very significant people in the city and beyond would find themselves in the middle of the hood. And that's when I felt like there was maybe a relationship between my history with clay and this new thing that was starting to develop. That we were, we were slowly starting to reshape how people imagined 
the south side of the city. One house turned into a few houses. And we always try to suggest that not only is creating a, a beautiful vessel important, but the contents of what happens in those buildings is also very important. So we were not only thinking about development, but we were thinking about the program. Thinking about the program, thinking about the kind of connections that could happen between one house and another, between one neighbor and another, that this building became what we call the listening house. And it has a collection of discarded books from the Johnson Publishing Corporation and other books from an old bookstore that was going out of business. I was actually just wanting to activate these buildings as much as I could with whatever and whoever would join me. In Chicago, there's amazing building stock. This building, which had been the former crack house on the block, and when the building became abandoned, it became a great opportunity to really imagine kind of what else could happen there. And so this space we converted into what we call Black Cinema House. Black Cinema House was an opportunity in the hood to screen films that were important and relevant to the folk who lived around me. That if we wanted to show an old Melvin Van Peoples film, we could. If we wanted to show Car Wash, we could. That would be awesome. The building we soon outgrew, and we had to move to a larger space. Black Cinema House, which was made from just a small piece of clay, had to grow into a much larger piece of clay, um, which is now my, uh, my studio. What I realized was that, for those of you who are um, zoning junkies, that some of the things that I was doing in these buildings that had been uh, left behind, they were not uh, the uses by which the buildings were built. And that there are city policies that say, hey, a house that is residential needs to stay residential. But what do you do in neighborhoods when ain't nobody interested in living there? That the people who have uh, the means to leave have already left. What do we do with these abandoned buildings? And so I was trying to wake them up using culture. We found that that was so uh, exciting for folk and people were so responsive to the work that we had to then find bigger buildings. By the time we found bigger buildings, there was in part the resources necessary to think about those things. In this bank that we call the Arts Bank, it was in pretty bad shape. Uh, there were about six feet of standing water. It was a difficult project to finance because banks weren't interested in the neighborhood, because people weren't interested in the neighborhood, because nothing had happened there. It was dirt. It was nothing. It was nowhere. And so we just started imagining what else, what else could happen in this building. And so now that the rumor of my block has spread and lots of people are starting to visit, we found that the bank can now be a center for exhibition, archives, music performance, and that there are people who are now interested in being adjacent to those buildings because we brought some heat, that we've kind of made a fire, that one of the archives that we'll have there is this Johnson Publishing Corporation. We've also started to collect memorabilia from American history from people who live or have lived in that neighborhood. Some of these images are degraded images of black people, kind of histories of very challenging content. And where better than a neighborhood that with young people who are constantly asking themselves about their identity to talk about some of the complexities of race and class. In some ways, the bank represents a hub that we're trying to create like a pretty hardcore node of cultural activity. And that if we could start to make multiple hubs and connect some cool green stuff around there, that the buildings that we've purchased and, and rehabbed, which is now around 60 or 70 units, that if we could kind of land kind of miniature Versailles on top of that and kind of connect these buildings by a beautiful green belt, <laughs> that this place where people never wanted to be would become a kind of an important destination for folk from all over the country and world. In some ways, it feels very much like uh, I'm a potter, that we, uh, we tackle the things that are at our wheel. Uh, we try with the skill that we have to kind of think about um, uh, this next bowl that I want to make. And it went from like bowl to a singular house, to a block, to a neighborhood, to a cultural district, to thinking about the city. And at every point, there were things that I didn't know that I had to learn. 
I mean, I've never learned so much about zoning law in my life. I never thought I'd have to. But as a result of that, I'm finding that there's not just room for my own artistic practice, there's room for a lot of other artistic practices. So people started asking us, well, the Astro, how are you going to go to scale? And what's your sustainability plan? <laughs> and what I found was that it, I couldn't export myself that what seems necessary in cities like Akron, Ohio, and Detroit, Michigan, and Gary, Indiana, is that there are people in those places who already believe in those places. They're already dying to make those places beautiful, and that often uh, those people who are passionate about a place are disconnected from the resources necessary to make cool things happen, or disconnected from a contingency of people that could help make things happen. So now we're starting to give advice around the country, on how to start with what you got, how to start with the things that are in front of you, how to make something out of nothing, how to reshape uh, your world at a wheel or at your block or at the scale of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think many people watching this will um, be asking themselves the question you just raised at the end, how can they do this in their own city? You can't export yourself. Give us a few pages out of your playbook about what someone who is inspired about their city can do um, to take on projects like yours. Um, one of the things that I've found that's really important is giving thought to not just the kind of individual project, like an a, a old house, but like what's the relationship between an old house, a local school, um, a small bodega, and is there some kind of synergy between those things? Can you get those folk talking? Um, I found that in cases where uh, neighborhoods have, have failed, they still often have a pulse. How do you identify the pulse in that place of passionate people? And then how do you get folk who have been fighting, slogging for like 20 years, re-energized about the place that they live? And so someone has to do that work that if I were a traditional developer, I would be talking about buildings alone and then putting a for lease sign in the window, I think that you actually have to curate more than that. That there's a way in which you have to be mindful about um, what are the businesses that I want to grow here? And then are there people who live in this place who want to grow those businesses with me? Because I think it's not just a cultural space or housing. There has to be the recreation of an economic core and so thinking about those things together mm -hmm. feels right. It's hard to get people uh, to create the spark again when people have been slogging for 20 years. Are there any methods you found that have, have helped break through? Yeah, I think that, that now there are lots of examples of folk who are doing amazing work. But those methods are sometimes like uh, when the media is constantly saying that only violent things happen in a place, then based on your skill set in a particular context, what are the things that you can do in your, in your neighborhood to kind of fight some of that? And so I found that, like, people, you know, if you're a theater person, you have outdoor street theater festivals. In some cases, um, we don't have the resources in certain neighborhoods to do things that are, like, a, a certain kind of splashy. But then if we can, like, find ways of making sure that people who are local to a place, plus people who could be supportive of the things that are happening local, when those people get together, yeah. I think really amazing things can happen. So interesting. And how can you make sure that the projects you're creating are actually for the disadvantaged and not just for the sort of vegetarian indie movie crowd that might move in to, to take right advantage on. of them? Right on. So I think this is where it starts to get into kind of the, the thick weeds. <laughs> that right now, <laughs> Let's go there. Um, Grand Crossing is 99% black, or at least living. And we know that maybe who owns property in a place is different from who walks the streets every day. So it's reasonable to say that Grand Crossing is already in the process of being something uh, different than it is today, right. right? But is there ways to kind of think about housing trusts or land trusts or mission-based um, development that starts to protect some of the space that happens? Because when you have 7,500 empty lots in a city, you want something to happen there, but you, but you need like entities that are not just interested in the development piece, but entities that are interested in the stabilization piece. And I feel like often the developer piece is really motivated, but the other work of a kind of neighborhood consciousness, that, that part doesn't live anymore. And so how do you start to grow up 
um, important uh, watchdogs that ensure that the resources that are made available to new folk that are coming in are also distributed to folk who have lived in a place for a long time. Makes so much sense. One more question. You make such a compelling case for, for beauty and the yeah. importance of beauty and the arts. There would be others who would argue that funds would be better spent on basic mm. services for the disadvantage. How do you combat that viewpoint or come against it? I believe that beauty is a basic service. That, uh, 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 that often what I've found is that when there, are, when there are resources that have not been made available to certain under-resourced cities or neighborhoods or communities, that sometimes culture is the thing that helps to uh, ignite mm -hmm. and that, that, you know, I can't do everything, but I think that there's a way in which if you can start with culture and get people kind of reinvested in their place, other kinds of adjacent amenities start to grow. And then people can make a demand that's a poetic demand mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the political demands that are necessary to wake up our cities, they also become very poetic. Makes perfect sense yeah. to me. Theaster, thank you so much thank for being so here much. with us today. Thank you. Theaster Gates. Fifty-four percent of the world's population lives in our cities. In developing countries, one-third of that population is living in slums. Seventy-five percent of global energy consumption occurs in our cities. And eighty percent of gas emissions that cause global warming come from our cities. So things that you and I might think about as global problems, like climate change, the energy crisis, or poverty, are really, in many ways, city problems. They will not be solved unless people who live in cities, like most of us, actually start doing a better job, because right now we are not doing a very good one. And that becomes very clear when we look into three aspects of city life. First, our citizens' willingness to engage with democratic institutions. Second, our city's ability to really include all of their residents. And lastly, our own ability to live fulfilling and happy lives. When it comes to engagement, the data is very clear. Voter turnout around the world peaked in the late 80s and it has been declining at a pace that we have never seen before. And if those numbers are bad at the national level, at the level of our cities, they are just dismal. In the last two years, two of the world's most consolidated, oldest democracies, the U.S., and France held nationwide municipal elections. In France, voter turnout hit a record low. Almost 40% of voters decided not to show up. In the US, the numbers were even scarier. In some American cities, voter turnout was close to 5%. I'll let that sink in for a second. We're talking about democratic cities in which 95% of people decided that it was not important to elect their leaders. The city of LA, a city of 4 million people, elected its mayor with just a bit over 200,000 votes. That was the lowest turnout the city had seen in 100 years. 
right here in my city of Rio, in spite of mandatory voting, almost 30% of the voting population chose to either annul their votes or stay home and pay a fine in the last mayoral elections. When it comes to inclusiveness, our cities are not the best cases of success either. And again, you don't need to look very far in order to find proof of that. The city of Rio is incredibly unequal. This is Leblon. Leblon is the city's richest neighborhood. And this is Complexo do Alemão. This is where over 70,000 of the city's poorest residents live. Leblon has an HDI, a Human Development Index, of 0.967. That is higher than Norway, Switzerland, or Sweden. Complexo do Alemão has an HDI of 0.711. It sits somewhere in between the HDI of Algeria and Gabon. So Rio, like so many cities across the global south, is a place where you can go from Northern Europe to Sub-Saharan Africa in the space of 30 minutes. If you drive, that is. If you take public transit, it's about two hours. <laughs> and lastly, perhaps most importantly, cities with the incredible wealth of relations that they enable could be the ideal places for human happiness to flourish. We like being around people, we are social animals. Instead, countries where urbanization has already peaked seem to be the very countries in which cities have stopped making us happy. The United States population has suffered from a general decrease in happiness for the past three decades. And the main reason is this. The American way of building cities has caused good quality public spaces to virtually disappear in many, many American cities. And as a result, they have seen a decline of relations, of the things that make us happy. Many studies show an increase in solitude and a decrease in solidarity, honesty, and social and civic participation. So, how do we start building cities that make us care? Cities that value their most important assets, the incredible diversity of the people who live in them. Cities that make us happy. Well, I believe that if we want to change what our cities look like, then we really have to change the decision-making processes that have given us the results that we have right now. We need a participation revolution, and we need it fast. The idea of voting as our only exercise in citizenship does not make sense anymore. People are tired of only being treated as empowered individuals every few years when it's time to delegate that power to someone else. If the protests that swept Brazil in June 2013 have taught us anything, is that every time we try to exercise our power outside of an electoral context, we are beaten up, humiliated, or arrested. And this needs to change. Because when it does, not only will people re-engage with the structures of representation, but also complement these structures with direct, effective, and collective decision-making. Decision-making of the kind that attacks inequality by its very inclusive nature. Decision-making of the kind that can change our cities into better places for us to live. But there is a catch, obviously. Enabling widespread participation and redistributing power can be a logistical nightmare. And there's where technology can play an incredibly helpful role by making it easier for people to organize, communicate, and make decisions without having to be in the same room at the same time.
Unfortunately for us, when it comes to fostering democratic processes, our city governments have not used technology to its full potential. So far, most city governments have been effective at using tech to turn citizens into human censors who serve authorities with data on the city, potholes, fallen trees, or broken lamps. They have also, to a lesser extent, invited people to participate on improving the outcome of decisions that were already made for them. Just like my mom when I was eight, and she told me that I had a choice. I had to be in bed by 8 p.m., but I could choose my pink pajamas or my blue pajamas. That's not participation. And in fact, governments have not been very good at using technology to enable participation on what matters. The way we allocate our budget, the way we occupy our land, and the way we manage our natural resources. Those are the kinds of decisions that can actually impact global problems that manifest themselves in our cities. The good news is, and I do have good news to share with you, we don't need to wait for governments to do this. I have reason to believe that it's possible for citizens to build their own structures of participation. Three years ago, I co-founded an organization called Milhiu. And we make it easier for people in the city of Rio to organize around causes and places that they care about in their own city and have an impact on those causes and places every day. In these past three years, Milhiu grew to a network